at one stage, I said, I said myself the, the task of finding the worst project in the world. I said, what would be the worst <laughs> project in the world? And I found this nuclear power plant in Japan called Monju. Uh, so this is the Monju uh, nuclear power plant. Monju means wisdom. And this power plant is anything but wisdom, you know. It took um, 20 years to get it approved and, and built. And, and there were so many problems. First, it was approved and they thought they could start. Then, uh, you know, it caught fire and they had to redo things. And this took years and years and years. It took so long that in the meantime, the Fukushima disaster happened. So the Fukushima happened, you know, uh, and then all of a sudden people were not that enthusiastic about nuclear power. So the, long story short, they ended up deciding we're not going to put this uh, nuclear power plant online. So they spent, you know, billions and billions of dollars uh, on the power plant. It never produced even one hour of electricity. It never produced anything. And now they're spending $3.5 billion decommissioning it, which will take another 15 years. So when it's finished, it's taken something like 35 years, spending something like $20 billion, and there's nothing to show for it. A very big fan of your work, I have to say. Um, you are an Oxford professor. You're the most cited scholar in the world on mega project man uh, planning, uh, and you've just released your latest book, "How Big Things Get Done," uh, a copy by here. Um, the subtitle: "The Surprising Factors Behind Every Successful Project, from Home Renovations to Space to Space Exploration." So I just love to know. What was it that kind of motivated you to write this new book? <laughs> the COVID crisis. <laughs> wow. You know, uh, I needed something to do while while we were all locked down. So that this is how I spent my lockdown. And I'm glad I did because I don't think I would have had any feeling for this period. It seemed like just, you know, two years that just uh, uh, fell by the wayside. And then now at least I have a book, you know, to show for it. But uh, of course... Actually, I was thinking about the book before the the pandemic, and uh, um, I felt that that I, you know, I've written many books before, but I felt like writing a book that sort of summed up all my experience at this stage, you know, which I thought would be a fun thing to do. So, what have I learned about my area, which is, uh, you know, uh, mega project planning and and management, or the leadership of big projects. Uh, and what have I learned so far? And then just try to get it everything, uh, get all of it into one book. And, and write it in a way where everybody could understand it, you know. So I've written sort of more academic books before. This time I wanted to uh, write a book that was totally solid regarding its academic foundation. So all the research, all the data are in there, as you will have noted if you read the book, but at the same time, explain everything in a way that anybody can read it. Sure. And uh, you, you absolutely are right. And you go through such a wide array of projects in this from things like just redesigning your kitchen and uh, and all things like this. But I would just love to kind of ask, because um, one of the things I was interested in, in terms of the work that you do academically, um, how long have you guys been collecting data on project management for? We started collecting data back in the late 90s uh, already uh, because we realized there were no data. So, uh, <laughs> that, that, so I discovered by almost by coincidence, because a big project was done in Denmark, and I would like to know the way the Danish project performed, how did that compare to other projects around the world? And I couldn't find any answers to that. There wasn't the, there wasn't the data set. So I, I figured, you know, this is the kind of thing scholars like this. There's, there's a wide area on the map, and you can go out and you can explore it, and then you can make it a non-wide area. You can fill it in. So that's what I decided to do. Uh, and that's when I started to collect data in the late uh, 90s. And then, you know, we've continued ever since. Uh, and we have, uh, you know, more than 16,000 projects for which we have data now. Wow. Wow. So for the people that uh, are listening to this now, and they may be wondering, like, what interest um, might be that, of this to me, if perhaps, as you said, you know, I'm not going out, I'm not designing the Sydney Opera House, or I'm not designing the, the uh, you know, the Empire State Building. Well, you were talk. I wonder if you could just talk about what you mean when you actually mean kind of project management, because you go through such a, a wide array in this book that really are, pl are applicable to every day. 
You know, I, I actually try not to use the term project management. It's the most boring term. It's like the dust <laughs> races, you know, from, the, from everything when you use that, that term. And I hate to use it. I don't like it. Yeah. Uh, but it's a fact that we all do projects uh, from very small projects, you know, uh, like, you know, putting on a birthday party or something. That's a project or going on holiday. That's a project. Buying a, you know, a new home is a, a project, uh, remodeling the kitchen and, and so on, all the way up to, you know, what Elon Musk is doing with SpaceX and with the building all the Gigafactory. Each Gigafactory is a, a project, you know, where they produce the electric vehicles and the batteries for the electric vehicles. So we have everything from small projects that we do in our private lives to huge projects like multi-billion dollar projects that government and business are doing and all sorts of different types of projects anywhere from you know putting on a wedding over a huge IT system like the National Health uh, Service IT system here in the UK which is one of the largest IT systems in the world and uh, to building the Empire State Building uh, as you said uh, to building an opera house to building mines, you know, dams, nuclear power plants, uh, wind farms, solar farms, it's all in there. And when I uh, first was interested, when I first saw your kind of book coming up in the upcoming list, and I was kind of, and it kind of caught my interest, and I had a hypothesis that kind of most projects would be uh, over cost, uh, you know, they would be slower. But I have to say the figure that you gave for your iron law of project management, I got to say it made for some pretty stark reading. It was a lot more dramatic than what I read. So if I, if I may, um, you say that in the book that 47.9% oh, of projects finish on budget, 8.5% of projects finish on budget and on time, and only 0.5% of projects finish on budget and on time and on benefit. That's pretty scary. It is, and, and it's a result that uh, has surprised us from the start. And in the beginning, we thought, you know, we only had a few hundred, at uh, 258 to be precise. That's the first data set we collected. Uh, and that's, you know, it's enough to get an idea of what's going on, but it could be that there were biases in the data that we that we looked at particularly bad project or something had happened during data collection that we were not aware of. Uh, but, you know, then we collected, uh, you know, several hundred more uh, projects, the results still the same. Then we collected a thousand more, the results still the same, another thousand and all the way up to the 16,000 plus that we have now. And this is the result. It's it's a very uh, solid result, you know. And and we are not the only ones, by the way. I should also emphasize this. All other scholars have taken this up after uh, my team and I started it uh, back in 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 the late nineties. Others have started doing research on this, and and the results are pretty much the same, you know. So so this this is accepted as as a finding, you know, not just because I say it, but other scholars are also saying it now. And. Interestingly, um, because kind of very anecdotally, I was going through the book, I was talking about it with some friends, and unanimously, like I had a number of people that had just been on holidays, and many people said to me, That actually sounds about right. That I'm going on holidays, I say to myself, This is my budget, this is how long. And no matter even when I make these plans, it almost always go over. And then I had some people even say, even when I knew that last year I went over 10 or 20% and I factored that in, I still went over. Yeah. So is yeah. that kind of common that you see? Yes, that is common. So even, you know, the, the world's leading expert on this is a psychologist from Princeton University called Daniel Kahneman. He won the Nobel Prize in economics in 2002, even though he's not an economist, he's a psychologist, but he's actually the, the godfather of behavioral economics, as they call it now. And he's written a book about this called Thinking Fast and Slow. And he says that even though I spent my life studying this optimism, you know, like what we're talking about here, we are optimistic about how long it takes to do something or how much something is going to cost. I still keep being optimistic, no matter how well I know this from my private life, from all my research and so on. I keep making, you know, those uh, mistakes of, of not getting the right estimate for how long something is going to take. Yeah. 
And I think this ties us perhaps into a first valuable point that perhaps we could give to our audience is what we're talking about by you, perhaps is Hofstadt as law. I wonder if you could talk about that because this was of interest to me in your book. <laughs> yeah, it's a funny law. So Hofstadt I said everything, everything takes longer than you think, even if you know Hofstadt as law, which is that everything <laughs> takes longer than you think. So Hofstadt as law says everything takes longer than you think. And then the real Hofstadt as law says everything takes longer than you think, even if you know Hofstadter's law. And that's exactly what Kahneman writes. He doesn't use those words, you know, but that's the message uh, of what he's writing in, in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow. Sure. And, and another law that kind of come up in conversations with friends before, um, when I was kind of coming up in conversations with them, because I was, I was asking people, you know, not only what doesn't work, but kind of what does. And uh, people would often tell me, for instance, you know, that if they had like an extreme deadline, you've sent me a, an essay in your class and I've only got four hours to the deadline. I haven't even started. There's a good chance that I'm, I may actually finish it at the same rate that if I start 16, 18 hours, tw- you know, 20 hours before. And this kind of an idea come up Parkinson's or this idea that work will expand to fill the time allotted for its completion. Um, I wonder, do you think about this law perhaps in your um in your work and, and kind of how relevant do you think it is i think it is relevant and i think it can be even more extreme than that that actually some people can't finish anything unless they have a gun to their head you know uh i actually one of my very good friends all the way back from when we started in university he has a real problem of uh, you know getting things done and he he ended up, he was really seeking in his career you know first he studied economic geography with me you know uh, at university and it didn't work then he changed into law for a couple of years that didn't work either and then he decided that he was going to be a journalist and me and all his friends we laughed so hard you know because like you you can't meet a deadline how are you going to be a journalist but it actually turned out this is exactly what he needed. And he's actually a live producer now. He produces live sports, you know, like the, the handball tournament that was just done, you know, a week ago or something, or the Olympics, or the Tour de France, those kinds of things. That's what he's producing. So he's right there during the live transmissions, uh, uh, producing that sport for Danish national TV. And it's the only thing that can make him do things on time and do the right things and get things done, you know, because when, like he says, you know, when I'm in the, you know, in the big bus with all the equipment and with my team, there's no way I cannot do what I have to do because everybody who's watching TV will see my errors. So there's such pressure on him in real time that he actually does what he has to do. But that's the only thing that can get, get him to do it. Yeah, and this is an interesting one for me because I also would kind of, perhaps for myself, perhaps in a little bit less less extreme to that, but I... I really like the pressure you know if i have no pressure and i i just try to be just consistently right in you know a, a dissertation or something like this I, I don't tend to work very well like that um and do you think that this actually perhaps plays out in in uh the completion of these projects um in the sense that perhaps if people did give themselves more extreme deadlines that we would see a much better completion rate I think that it, it varies a lot with individual psychology. So for some people, I think you are absolutely right. For other people, it wouldn't be the right thing to do because they hate deadlines like that. They actually get inefficient if they if they have a deadline. Some people, especially creative types, like if you told Picasso, you know, you have to paint the painting now before 12 o'clock tomorrow. He wouldn't, he wouldn't take it well, you know. He would say, no, I'm, I'm an artist. I need to you know, go with my ideas and follow the flow of uh, of those and, and then, you know, work when the inspiration is there and so on. So so uh, I think it varies a lot, even though many artists also say it's not just about inspiration, it's all also perspiration. You know, there's this law, you know, things are only 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration. A lot of people, particularly from, from where I am in Wales, we're very, very unhappy about how slow uh rail lines and things are, are being built and it i think pro, perhaps even if you like look overseas and you see some of the for instance the rail infrastructure that somewhere like china has it's pretty remarkable um and it, is it the case that perhaps this is just some sort of comparison fallacy in my mind or is it the case that perhaps these other countries in the world china singapore qatar 
are they just giving them the their workers more extreme deadlines to kind of build these things? What's going on? No, if you look at authoritarian regimes like that, like take China for example, as you mentioned, they don't have the same laws regarding environment and and uh, and you know you have to hear people and if you're going to expropriate people's homes like like uh, you do for a rail line like you're talking about so like here in the uk right now that's high speed two right the the high speed rail line from london to birmingham and further north there's a whole process you have to go through whereas in china you just go out and you pretty much tell people we are we are, we are building a rail line here and you don't have that kind of process they i'm sure they have some process but it's much faster and it has less protection for uh, the individual uh, the homeowner so you and and the same with environmental issues and safety issues and so on so there are things that uh, they don't have to do in china that you have to do in the uk that makes it take longer in the uk and i had to say that i meet a lot of countries that that uh, so we have data for uh, more than 130 countries and we work all over the world with uh, both government and business building big projects and because there are these cost overruns and delays and benefit shortfalls everywhere, everyone feels bad about it. And they think they're worse than their neighboring countries. So everybody thinks they're worse than others. And that's actually not true. Uh, all countries, even China, has delays and cost overruns on their projects. So we've studied uh, 79 projects, uh, rail and road projects in China. It's very difficult to get data from China. That's why we don't have so many projects. They don't give it away easily, but uh, we, we were able to uh, get uh, data through the back door, so to speak, by working with the World Bank, you know, who has funded some projects in China, so we could get data for those, and, and we found that even for projects that are going through the rigorous procedures of the World Bank, there were cost overruns and delays. Right, right. So if today I wanted to go and rebuild the pyramids, uh, perhaps having a communist uh, country as opposed to a democratic one might be a more efficient way of doing it yeah you get it, it, it's it's easier to get things going and 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 to get things done there's also an ability to tax you know to a much more extreme degree so so the government has more funds simply you know which which makes a difference there is a problem in the uk though and in many countries but the uk is particularly bad and that's productivity so the productivity in delivering infrastructure in the uk is not very high and that's a real problem you know and and nobody totally understands why but even worse no, nobody totally understands how to solve the problem and it's a problem that has been very persistent you know through decades people were generally said to me why, why do things in the uk why do they take so long to build do you have any hypothesis perhaps i, I wouldn't use the worst lazy i you no. know so i'm i'm from scandinavia and i but i've lived here for a long time now more than 10 years and and i don't i don't see brits as lazy you know at yeah. all yeah. But uh, I don't know, maybe there's a culture, you know, that it's okay that things take a while, you know, you don't, you don't need to, I, I tend to see that, for instance, when a building or a shop or something goes out of use, or when a piece of land is going to be used to build a new building and so on, it often takes an incredibly long time before anybody starts doing anything. So the property is just sitting there. You know whether it's an, a vacant piece of land or whether it's actually a building or a business and it seems like there's a, a there's a tradition of that's okay you know that that we don't need to put things back in use quickly we can just let them sit there for one two three four five years before somebody says okay now i'm actually going to uh, uh, to build this thing or remodel this thing or whatever it is so i think that that might just be part of the culture here or maybe Maybe the planning procedures are so demanding that it actually takes years and years and years to get permission to do something new on on an existing property on an, or on a piece of land. Sure, sure, and it's worth worth me kind of countering my other point um, in that I know some people that kind of are involved in that space, and they, they are very very hard workers. So perhaps it does come from some sort of culture. Um, above them or some other reasons which would be really interesting thing worth studying yeah. um, I, I would love to kind of ask you because in this book you go through some great examples of projects that succeeded um, which, which were really fantastic projects and also projects that were pretty disastrous so I wonder if you could kind of talk us through perhaps an example on both ends sure 
So uh, to start at the positive end with the really, uh, you know, successful projects, this, this has actually been the biggest problem because like you said, it's only half a percent. So that's one out of 200 projects. So for us as scholars, it's actually difficult to get a sufficiently large database with successful projects that we can say something meaningful. But we, we, we've done that. We've looked very carefully at the successful projects. And of course, the first question you want to ask is, were they successful because they were lucky? Because that's one thing, you know, like that's not very interesting if, if people were just lucky. Uh, but it actually turns out that that's not the main explanation, that uh, we, we are able to find projects where the people who did those projects were able to repeat it over and over and over again. So there's, uh, there, there's no way statistically that they would be able to deliver so many projects successfully. And one example of this is actually Pixar movies. Uh, so Hollywood has existed for around 120 years. You know, we have been producing uh, movies out of Hollywood. But Pixar is the only studio that has ever done, you know, a whole string of blockbusters, like more than 20 now, one after another, where, where one is more successful than the previous one. And that just doesn't fit the, the general understanding of doing films. You know, everybody in Hollywood would say that it's hit and miss, you know, and, and often they think a film is going to be a sure hit and it's not a hit at all. It, it actually goes bust, you know. And opposite, there are films like even classics like Casablanca, you know, with, with Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman, which is like a huge classic. This was like just a throw off that they did very low budget. Nobody expected anything of that film. People still watch it today, you know. Uh, so you have the opposite that, that that things that you didn't expect to become a success would become a big success. So that's what I mean by hit and miss. And that's how people understand Hollywood films in general. And, and that's the right understanding when you look at the data, except for Pixar, who is able to do one success after another. So we decided we're going to pick the brains of the people at Pixar to find out how do they do this thing that no other Hollywood studio have done in more than a hundred years history. And uh, and uh, it was super interesting. So Pete Doctor, who's the creative director there, uh, uh, we, we got a chance to pick his brain at length and Ed Catmull, who used to be the CEO, both at Pixar actually and at Disney Animation, uh, same thing. And it turns out that the reason that they are so successful is that they are very rigorous in their preparation. They just go through many iterations of uh, the idea of the film uh, before they start shooting it. So they spent several years up front from just a, uh, you know, a simple idea. So Pete Doctor explained to us, for instance, the film called Inside Out. He got the idea one morning in the shower. He apparently gets ideas in the shower. Uh, and uh, and he, he thought it would be fun to make a film about a, a girl who's all in, in her head. So a child, a girl who's all in her head. And uh, so that was just an idea. And then he went, he talked to the to his colleagues and so on. Yes, said, yeah, that could be an idea and so on. And then he said, I'm going to write it down, you know, like let me, let me try to make a 10, 12 page memo, you know, like if I had to expand this idea a little bit, what would it be? And that's actually the first step after the idea in the Pixar process is to write a, 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 a 10 to 12 page synopsis. Then you circulate that and get feedback from all the colleagues at Pixar who are working on other movies. You don't have to take their feedback into account as the director. It's a positive asset for you that you can use if you want, and you can just disregard it if you don't want. If you don't think it, it benefits your idea, you just disregard it. Then you write a longer script, and then a longer one, and then a longer one, you know, like three, four rounds. Then you start doing storyboards. Then you actually try, to, then they start drawing pictures, like images of what is it that's going to go on in this film. Maybe, uh, you know, like a few dozen, that turns into a hundred, that turns into a thousand, that turns into 3000. Then they start film, filming them, maybe just with a, you know, just a normal camera, or even your phone, you know, you, you just film those different images and then you play them uh, one after the other. Now you're beginning to get an idea of what's the motion in this film. You put, you might even put sound on it, some voiceover, uh, I mean, speech and, and, uh, and music to get an idea of what is it that we are aiming for here. And this is like what I'm talking about here is iteration after iteration over several years. And only then, you know, when you have a script that is more than a hundred pages long and you have the storyboards and you try the, the whole thing over and over, everybody has a clear idea of what is it that we are producing here. Then they, they pull out the heavy artillery, which are the real animation computers, you know, 
which are big and expensive, and they hire in, you know, the the famous actors who are doing the voice voices for the film, and they hire the people who are going to do the score and so on. All the expensive stuff only comes after all this careful planning. And we call it, you know, we, we say there's a rhythm to the successful projects that are think slow, act fast. So once Pixar knows exactly what it is they're shooting, they can actually shoot the movie fairly quickly. That's the secret. So in terms of that one, this is a real interesting one to me because most people perhaps they think the opposite. They think, let's just get some momentum going and we'll figure it out. But it seems to me what Pixar are doing is they are front loading all the hard work. So exactly. by the time it comes to actually doing it, it's just a seamless process. I wouldn't call it seamless. I mean, no. they're, 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 nothing is ever seamless when you're talking <laughs> about big projects, not even, not even your holiday as we talked about or, <laughs> or a wedding and so on or kitchen renovation. So it's not seamless, but it's a lot uh, less filled with problems than if you didn't do this. So it's very important to do and, and Pixar are much better prepared. And it's something we can all learn from. Think slow, act fast. And if you think about it, there are, there are many sayings, you know, that like people in people on construction sites, they say, measure twice, cut once, right? Measure twice, cut once. That's the carpenter's rule. And if you only measure once, you know, you regret it because you might have to go out and get another piece of wood, you know, and throw away what you cut uh, before you had secured your measurement. President Lincoln uh, used to say that if he had 15 minutes to cut down a tree, he would spend 10 minutes sharpening the ax. That's the same thing, you know, you prepare well, you take your time in preparing, and then you can do the job swiftly. I love that. And one other thing to me that it seems like Pixar was doing was that they were testing the fragility of their ideas by getting feedback. Yeah. Um, and again, not many people tend to do that, you know, because if you put an idea out there and, and a lot of people tell you that it's a bad idea or this, that, and the other, then, you know, that, that, that can be painful, but they seem to kind of nakedly want to show their project and get the feedback early. Is that what I'm hearing? That's absolutely right. They have something they call the brain trust at Pixar. So this is like the really experienced people who are doing movies like this all the time. And, and they give feedback on each other's ideas and each other's scripts and each other's uh, storyboards and so on. And uh, that is testing the fragility. So you get a lot of feedback and, and people are told that's not going to work and I wouldn't do it like that or this is the way to do it. And so Pete Doctor told us very clearly that there are not many ideas that survive, you know, from the beginning to the end, that it's a very, it's a very rigorous process that actually is weeding out things, you know, brutally. It's a brutal process in the sense, you don't feel it as brutal necessarily, but it's brutal in the sense that uh, original ideas don't survive they get improved. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Say I really love that point. Um, what about in terms of a project that you would say was a disaster? Boy, there's so many to choose from. I actually, <laughs> at, one, at one stage, I said, I said myself the, the task of finding the worst project in the world. I said, what would be the worst project <laughs> in the world? And I found this nuclear power plant in Japan called Monju. Uh, so this is the Monju uh, nuclear power plant. Monju means wisdom. And this power plant is anything but wisdom, you know. Um, it took um, 20 years to get it approved and, and built. And, and there were so many problems. First, it was approved and they thought they could start. Then, uh, you know, it caught fire and they had to redo things. And this took years and years and years. And uh, it took so long that in the meantime, the Fukushima disaster happened. So the Fukushima happened, you know, uh, and then all of a sudden people were not that enthusiastic about nuclear power. So the, long story short, they ended up deciding we're not going to put this uh, nuclear power plant online. So they spent, you know, billions and billions of dollars uh, on the power plant. It never produced even one hour of electricity. It never produced anything. And now they're spending $3.5 billion decommissioning it, which will take another 15 years. So when it's finished, it's taken something like 35 years, spending something like $20 billion, and there's nothing to show for it. That's about <laughs> the worst uh, project that, that I've seen. But the sad thing is that it's not nearly as extreme as it sounds. And there are worse projects if you're beginning to look at, like, people getting killed on projects and things like that. So there was a high-speed rail line in China 
where the people building it, uh, the builders actually, due to corruption, they didn't use the right materials. So they skimped on the materials. That's not something you want to do with a high-speed rail line. It has to be safe, right? So one train that was thundering down the tracks, you know, uh, at high speed, derailed and killed 42 people. So that's that's pretty bad too, right? Uh, so if you uh, start looking at things like that, they're much worse projects. I just I was just thinking in terms of something that is not dramatic with in in the sense of life lives lost, but just like lots of money lost, lots of time lost, and nothing to show for it. Yeah, that's really interesting. And in terms of kind of some of the projects that you studied, we'll put a uh, we can put a table on the screen for our listeners. Uh, but in terms of the mean cost overrun, some of the top five included nuclear storage. The Olympic Games, uh, nuclear power, hydroelectric dams, um, and then at the bottom, solar power, energy transmission. Um, that was quite a telling list for me. Um, do you think that there's perhaps anything from that list that policymakers perhaps should be paying considerable attention to? I think so. And this is actually something we present for the first time in the book. So this is an original new research result that is in the book that we've never, never shown before. So up until uh, this book, uh, I have studied this for the Olympics and, and saw that, okay, the Olympics have extreme risk. You know, we call it fat tails. A fat tail just means that in the statistical distribution, there are many extreme values. So extreme cost overruns, extreme delays, extreme benefit shortfalls. And the Olympics uh, has extreme cost overruns. And uh, I also uh, have studied IT. Uh, IT is even worse, actually, than the Olympics. Mm. Uh, it's the worst project type of all regarding extreme outliers. Uh, but in the book, we, we did this for all 25 different project types. So we can actually rank all of them now and see that the very least risky is, uh, is solar power and wind power. And the most risky are nuclear storage, Olympics, and IT. And, and nuclear power yeah. so uh, uh so uh, uh, and it's a huge difference so the worst projects are much much worse than the best projects you know so so uh, it you, it really matters so therefore yes the answer is yes to your question should people be studying this yes this is like a roadmap you can you can see what it, you can see uh, you know depending on which project type you take on these are going to be your risks big or low yeah, it was certainly telling. And one of the things that I kind of really took from your book, and I got to say that I, I have to give myself some credit. There, there are many things in your book that I thought, I'm not very good at that. I'm not very good at that. But saying no to things is actually when I, I would say I'm actually okay at. And I love the Steve Jobs quote from the book. You said, I'm as proud of the things that we haven't done as opposed to the things that we have. Meaning that in terms of, actually getting things done, completing projects, sometimes it's important to say no to things, almost maybe just as important as saying yes. How important do you think that that is? Extremely important. And I think that uh, Jobs would say that this was actually key to the success of Apple. When he came back, they were all over the place, you know, regarding products. And uh, I think he came back in 1997 or something after having been out for quite a long time and uh, and uh, the people who had been in charge of Apple uh, up to that point uh, had developed all these different products, you know, and different versions of the same product. So it was very confusing. And uh, Jobs said, we're going to make four products and that's it. Four products, you know, uh, in each of four categories. And uh, and he stuck to that and, and he turned Apple around by doing it that way. So he would say that this was this was key to their success. And I think that this is a general thing. Focus, focus, focus. You can't be successful if you're not focused, uh, and uh, and this is something uh, about projects that saying no helps doing. If you say no to things, you can focus on the things that you say yes to, right? If you say yes to everything, you're going to be all over the place very quickly. There's also a thing about saying no to things that cannot be done. You know, sometimes project leaders are being asked to do projects that they actually they know that it's not possible to deliver them to the budget that they're given and so on, and sometimes project leaders you know feel that feel that it's difficult to say to uh, whoever is paying and who owns the project to say that it can't be done you know but i think it's an important thing you you can actually 
that we have examples of people who have destroyed their career by saying yes to something that couldn't be done, you know, because then your name gets attached to it and, and then that's your reputation. One of the things that I would say I really admire about you is not only are you obviously a, a very, very accomplished academic, but you also actually test your ideas out in the battlefield. You obviously offer uh, consulting services and whatnot. I'd love to know um, kind of how do you kind of uh, come to the process and what you will say yes to or what will you, or why you will say no to? Do you have like a process of deciding of like whether you'll say yes or no to something? It's actually quite simple for me. Uh, because I'm an academic, I'm always interested in learning. That's my job is to learn stuff, you know, and it has to be new stuff. There's, there, as an academic, you can't survive if you, if you learn something that somebody has already learned before and then you write that up and it's already been written up before. It won't even be published because people will say, well, there, there's, always, there's already an article or a book about that, so uh, we're not interested. So as an academic, you need to find new stuff always. So for me, the criterion is, is this something new that I would learn something from? And that is actually interesting enough that you can write about it so that other people will also be interested. That's my criterion for choosing to do stuff. And if I've already done something, I don't want to do it again. So I won't. Normally, consultants, there's nothing they love more than if they can get, the, you know, do the same job again, because that's then you then you know how to do it. And it's easier to do it in a way where you make money on it, like if you're a, a business consultancy. For me, I'm not interested in that. I'm after the knowledge. So it, it doesn't make sense for me to do the same thing twice. I want something new once I've done something, you know, then others uh, can take over, you know, and do it. And, and that happens, obviously, a lot. I love that. I really, really love that point. And in terms of something you said there was was quite interesting in terms of, you know, learning new things. And this actually took me perhaps to a point in your book where perhaps it's also valuable to learn things from the past. And you talk about in the book about Aristotle and his idea of phrenesis, if I pronounce that correctly. You do. I, I, thank you. I wonder if you could talk about, about that one. Yeah, this is a very interesting concept. It means practical wisdom. Sometimes people translate it as common sense, but and in, in a sense, it's okay. But sometimes, you know, common sense, common is not necessarily a positive word, so it can be too common, right? <laughs> so I prefer practical wisdom, which is also a, a, a totally accepted translation of the concept of phrenesis. So it's an original ancient Greek term that goes all the way back to uh, Aristotle uh, in ancient Greece more than 2,000 years ago. And, and he talked a lot about this. He actually said, this is the most important intellectual virtue virtue that uh, people can have. And it's the virtue of uh, knowing to do the right thing, but also knowing how to do it. Not only knowing which thing to do, but also knowing how to do the right thing, you know. And, uh, and he says, this is the most important skill that a person can have. I wrote a whole book about this, actually, uh, called Making Social Science Matter. Uh, 20 years ago so it's a it's a concept that has been with me for a long time it's not something we're introducing for the first time in this book and i find it an extremely useful concept you know to uh operate in the world and as an academic not ending up in in what i consider a dead-end street where you where what you produce the knowledge you produced is not used it's just like it just ends up in 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 papers and in books and it doesn't necessarily have an impact on society if you if you do it as phrenesis, then the whole idea is that it, it has to have an impact on society. You know that that is it is how do you do these things? How do you do them in practice? That's why it's called practical wisdom. It's not wisdom. It's practical wisdom. It's about doing things in practice. Yeah, that's a really really great concept. And just a couple more uh, concepts from your book. Um, I, I got a lot of themes from your book that kind of relate to Lego. And yeah. uh, this is this is a real interesting idea. And I think that people perhaps with a real engineering mindset would really kind of relate this. So I wonder kind of when you talk about building something with Lego, kind of what are you referring to with it? Yeah, so Lego is a Danish toy. I'm Danish and, uh, and Lego is actually the world's largest toy manufacturer now, uh, uh, which they didn't used to be. They've really been successful with Lego. Everybody loves Lego and, and you probably grew up with Lego. I grew up with Lego. I remember stepping on Lego and hurting my feet. That's one of the first memories I have as a young kid. My older brother would be playing with Lego and I would be stepping on it and it hurt. So I better get down on my 
uh, on all four and start playing with it also on the floor, right? So uh, that's a fond memory. And I find in the book, I find that Lego is a good metaphor for doing something in a standardized modular way, we call it. So modular is a really boring word and modularization, even worse, you know, a real tongue twister. <laughs> uh, but it's really the secret to uh, projects that are done uh, easily, quickly, and successfully, that they have an element of modularity, sometimes 100% modular. Like, it really is like building blocks. You click together like Legos, click, click, click. Think about a wind turbine. One of the reasons that wind farms and wind turbines and, and, and uh, you know, wind-produced electricity is so hugely successful and so cheap today is that uh, wind farms are now built like Legos. So one wind turbine has four Legos. There's the foundation, there's a tower, there's the nacelle, that's the turbine, and then there are the, the, the blades that you, that you put on the nacelle, and you just take foundation, click on the tower, you click on the nacelle, you click on the, the blades, and you have a wind turbine that is ready to produce electricity within 24 hours. That used to be something you built on sites a long time ago, and it would take months and months, in the beginning, actually years. But so it was like a construction process to uh, project. Today, it's not, it's an assembly site. It's not a construction site. So all the wind turbines, of course, are produced in factories now. And then they are transported on sites, even offshore in the Irish Sea and the North Sea, you know, the most difficult conditions that you can build on. Them. They have these huge boats that they bring them out and cranes, and they just put them up in a few hours. They are up and ready to produce. And that's... That's Lego, and uh, it's just one example. Solar is even more Lego-like, even more modular. A solar cell, the cell is the basic Lego. Then you put a bunch of cells, you have a panel. Then you have a bunch of panels, you have an array. Then you can build as many arrays as you want, and you have a multi-billion dollar wind farm, no, a solar farm, sorry. And, and that's the way you do things successfully. And we are actually very, very lucky that the people who have developed, uh, you know, wind, uh, uh, power and solar power has done it in this modular fashion because otherwise we wouldn't be able to solve the climate crisis right now. These two are the most important single things, you know, for, for solving the climate crisis. And they are modular. They are Legos, totally Lego. And they are the least risky projects as, as we saw in the diagram we talked about before. They're the least risky process. They have projects. They can be done the fastest. They have the smallest cost overrun. They have the smallest delays and so on. And they're very reliable. Once they're up, they really produce uh, what they promise to produce. Um, one of the things that kind of comes to my mind with the Lego metaphor is when I think back to my own life and various times that projects have really taken a long time is when I really don't have clarity on where to go next. And a lot of people kind of say the same to me, but when you're building Lego, you think to yourself, okay, well, I got the diagram, but I know the arm goes here. I know this goes by here. Um, is that one of the things that if we can get clarity on perhaps what to do in a sequential order, yeah. um, perhaps that is something which will reduce the friction and perhaps improve our efficiency? Sex yeah, sex absolutely. Yeah, and it, it's a key principle in the book, but we turn it upside down, actually. So we call it think from right to left. Most people will think from left to right or read from left to right, right? But and the and the diagrams that project uh, planners and project managers use uh, so over the project process are read from left to right. We say you have to start on the right. You like you like you mentioned with your Lego drawing, you have the diagram, right? That that's that shows you what the end product is that you want to arrive at. That's our advice: is you have to know exactly what it is that you want to arrive at on the right of the diagram then you work your way backwards all the way to the left and then you start doing what you have to do and you never lose sight on the right of the right you always keep your eyes out there on the right because if you do that no matter where you are in the process and no matter what you do you know you're doing the right thing because it's contributing to the product on the right so there are many different names for this you know at amazon they call it thinking backwards we call it think from right to left or they call it working backwards. Sorry, working backwards. We call it think from right to left. I love that. And, and as a, a connoisseur of mental models, I've absolutely kind of loved this conversation. And just to that point, um, I actually, video games actually came to my mind when you were talking about that, because one of the reasons that I, many, many years ago, not so much these days, was so addicted to video games 
was because they're extremely clear on what you have to do to get from level four to level five, level five to level six. And perhaps we could, we should take some of that wisdom, perhaps to our own lives. Um, but man, I appreciate that you're a, you're an extremely busy man. I know you've got places to be. We can, um, oh guys, pick up the book. And is there any perhaps closing thoughts that, that you've got for us? I think my closing thought is that, uh, and, and one of the things that has become increasingly clear to me throughout my career is how general the issues are from the smallest private project to the biggest public project to the biggest business project. So this is, uh, uh, you know, it's a thing that is relevant for all of us. That's, that's, that's one thing that I think is an, an, an important message. And also, the fact that it's such basic psychology that is at play, you know, when you, things go wrong and when things go right. And that's why that th that's why we find this everywhere, you know, that and, and in all project types, we find the same issues. It's because it's actually humans who are doing these things, right? And the humans are bringing their biases with them. You know, a lot of it is about cognitive bias, like optimism bias. Like, well, if you're optimistic, you're going to be optimistic about anything pretty much, you know, and therefore we see that. So, yeah, so both when you look at the projects themselves, uh, we're doing we're all doing projects. And in fact, they become more and more important. We will not be able to solve the climate crisis and the pandemic. The pandemic is actually and one encouraging thing about the pandemic was to see how quickly we could do projects when we have to and get vaccines produced and so on. That was very encouraging, you know, and that we should all take, uh, you know, uh, we should all be uplifted uh, by that, you know, that we can actually do these things. Sure. But where can these guys connect with you? Are you on social media? Yes. So I'm on uh, LinkedIn and Twitter. And, and everybody's very welcome to connect with me there and to comment on what I'm doing. Also, uh, the new stuff that we're doing, and we are always doing new stuff, you know, including now, uh, is, is always posted on LinkedIn and, and Twitter. So that uh, if you want to keep up to what we are doing, my team and I, that's where you'll find it first. We will put a link below to the book. We'll put a link towards your LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, we always finish our podcast off with with our seminal question, and that is, what makes a life worth living? What makes a life worth living? That's a really good question. Love. I love it. <laughs> man, yeah. man i really really appreciate you taking the time i loved loved um going through your book and kind of finding out more about you um i know that our guys are gonna um like love this book and particularly for people that kind of like myself that kind of love these like thinking concepts that like can have actual practical measurable results I really, really appreciate kind of the work that you've done. And um, I really excited to kind of see where uh, you go in the future. So, man, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been a privilege. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure and honor to be, be here. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it.